When we talk about mortality, we are talking about our children, writes Joan Didion in Blue Nights. Joan Didion dwells on mortality throughout her most recent memoir, which we will be speaking about tonight, Blue Nights, in which she tries to cope with, or at least understand the loss of her daughter. She did so also, she wrote also about mortality in the year of magical thinking and in Blue Nights has focused on the deaths of her husband and daughter, hesitantly allowing us a glimpse into her carefully edited makeshift diary. In Blue Nights, she scribes intensely detailed family moments and reflects on these often to no significant realization except that they're over. Tonight, she will be in conversation with Sloane Crosley, the author of How Did You Get This Number? And I was told there'd be cake. After the conversation, there will be an occasion for you to ask questions. Now, in my many years of inviting various guests, I've realized that any question can be asked in about 52 seconds. So I encourage you to ask questions rather than make lengthy comments. And there's going to be a microphone put right here in the front so that you can make eye contact with Joan Didion and Sloan Crosley while you ask your very short and incredibly good question. <laughs> now, you know that I don't like asking the guests anymore for a long biography. I even like less having publishers send me long biographies. Um, all the guests who come here are extraordinarily accomplished. But what they haven't done before coming here is having me ask them for a seven-word biography. So I ask each guest to give me a seven-word bio, in some way a haiku of sorts, some, a tweet, if you wish, that um, will define them or not at all. Um, sometimes not in the least. Sloane Crosley wrote, bit into dessert looking for a meal. <laughs> all right. Joan Didion wrote, seven words do not yet define me. Sloan Crosley, Joan Didion. Well, hello. Hello. So. How are you? <laughs> um, thank you, and thank you to the Young Lions and to the library for, for hosting us, and um, most of all, to you for uh, gracing us with your presence here tonight. Well, thank you, Sloan. You're welcome. Um, I was going to read a little bit before I start putting you under the heat lamps which I thought would be metaphorical, but it's really very bright on this stage. Um, I wanted to read a little bit of a sort of makeshift biography of you, which we discussed a little bit, uh, me doing backstage, just because I think with the last two publications, um, with the Year of Magical Thinking and now with Blue Nights, I think you've uh, certainly broadened your audience more than ever, and I think this audience is probably pretty familiar with your earlier work, but just in case, not. You are, as you may well be aware, um, <laughs> the author of five novels and 11 books of nonfiction, including Slouching Towards Bethlehem, The White Album, and After Henry, named for your first editor, the late Henry Robbins. Also, Where I Was From and The Year of Magical Thinking, which won the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award in 2005. Um, this is also the simplified elevator version. I'm leaving out whole swaths. Um, a fifth-generation Californian, Sacramento specifically. You moved to New York in 1956, where you began working for Vogue magazine, and where you also wrote your first novel, Run River, 
Several years later, you moved back to Los Angeles with your husband, John Gregory Dunn, where you lived for five years on Franklin Avenue, a house that you tend to not be so kind to in your work. Oh. Um, <laughs> and you wrote Play It As It Lays there, so it can't have been all bad. Actually, I loved that house. Really? Yeah, it was like an abandoned fraternity house. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it was just a, a big house that was, that was totally abandoned. It's, it's, it, it's, um, it was in it, what, what, what a friend of mine kept referring to as, as your senseless killing neighborhood. The senseless killing neighborhood? Yeah. <laughs> so not yet gentrified. Not yet gentrified. Or maybe, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I always feel like it gets held up in comparison to the Brentwood house. And there's just not that many floral descriptions of the Franklin Avenue house. No, no, no. Well, everything was dead. <laughs> <laughs> So not so kind to it, <laughs> um, but maybe loved if, if yeah. it's shambles. Um, but uh, there you also uh, adopted your daughter, Quintana Roo, and then the whole family, and again, please chime in if this is wrong, uh, moved over to Malibu where you wrote several films with your husband, including The Panic in Needle Park and the Star is Born remake. And then, I guess having had enough of that in 1998, uh, 1988, excuse me. You moved back to the East Coast, to New York, and continued writing essays, fiction, and criticism. And that same year, you covered the Democratic primary and watched the staging of Michael Dukakis throwing a baseball on an airport tarmac. That's really it. More or less, yeah. Okay. That, that pretty Good. much sums it up. Yeah. That's pretty much it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Just the baseball on there. Yeah. Okay, we can go. <laughs> um, Anyway, so, well, the first time I actually uh, ever read you was probably the first essay I think a lot of people had ever read, maybe, uh, which was Goodbye to All That. Um, and then the first time I communicated with you was about 10 years ago, and it was my first week at Vintage Books where I was working. Um, and I sent you an email uh, about some sort of travel logistics, which I think was a two-line email and probably had about 20 typos. Didn't we go someplace together? We did go someplace together. Yeah. That was later. What? <laughs> we went to, um, I picked you up and I uh, walked you across the floor at BEA, uh, which is Book Expo America. It takes place in the Javits Center. Why would I, why did I think it was Fairfield, Connecticut? No. Oh, do you think we, I don't think so. No, okay. I feel like I would have remembered. <laughs> I <Yeah>. hope so. <laughs> Well, because I'm such a giant fan, and uh, still am, which is uh, what I can attribute the typos to. But now you can't see them, because <laughs> they're on these cards. <laughs> so that works out well. Um, so I do want to get into your first, uh, into your most recent publication. But before that, the first thing I thought of for tonight was how funny you are, and that I don't think people always notice it, um, or, they, or they don't quite tune into the sort of judicious use of humor in your work, and it's, it's always been there, whether it is Michael Dukakis or Nancy Reagan trimming a rose bush. Um, but it's also in Blue Nights, which if anyone is familiar with the book now and has read the reviews, um, is obviously not a, a totally cheery account. Um, but it's got some beautiful bits of humor about your daughter uh, when you try to remove her tooth by slamming it into a door. Um, or when you fall in your apartment and you have to be taken to Lenox Hill and you said that you had been taken to Lenox Hill and woken up in Driving Miss Daisy. Well, yes. <laughs> and I was going to ask you to read a brief passage uh, just right off the bat, uh, which I thought sort of exemplified that a little bit. Um, and in it, uh, you might have a, I don't know if this is weird to get into graphic medical detail, but you might have a small intestinal bleed and they're trying to test for it um, at Columbia Presbyterian ICU. They asked me to, they say they're, they're that they are going, they're going to demonstrate to themselves what was causing the bleed by having me swallow a very small camera. And I <laughs> resisted this idea, since I had never in my life been able even to sm swallow an aspirin. And so I said, I didn't think I could swallow a camera. <laughs> and they said, of course you can, it's only a very little camera. 
There was a pause. The attempt at briskness declined into wheedling. It's really a very little camera. <laughs> In the end, I did swallow the very little camera. And the very little camera transmitted the desired images, which did, or did, which did not demonstrate what was causing the bleed, but did demonstrate that, that with sufficient sedation, anyone can swallow a very little camera. <laughs> You. <laughs> um, do you think that people, I mean, is, is, is that sort of something that you go back in and, and pepper into the narrative or that comes naturally when you write it on the first shot, that kind of humor and timing? Uh, that comes pretty naturally. Uh, I think people don't notice it because it makes them uncomfortable. To, because of the subjects, because of the, the subjects. umbrella, it, yeah. Uh, so they, so they tend to not. It embarrasses them. Ah, I see. But of course, that is. Yeah. What happened? It doesn't embarrass you. I think it actually just sort of gives it new texture. Mm -hmm. um, but speaking of other sort of misapprehensions, I'm trying to get them all out of the way. Um, I think it was in Political finch Fictions, you mentioned that one of the great things about being small is that people do not notice you and you become invisible. And in this book, you do mention that uh, pretty much every reporter who's ever encountered you comments on your size um, as if it had somehow escaped your attention. Um, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> do you find it's advantageous? You're really very small, people say. Yeah. Do they say you're really very small? Yeah. What do you say back? I say yes. <laughs> yeah. You're unusually large. Yeah. <laughs> well, you said it was useful for reporting, but I wonder if, as well, time has it, gone on, it, it still is. It's, it's, it's useful. It was useful for reporting at a certain moment in time because people just simply didn't take me seriously because I was so small. Um, so if they weren't taking me seriously, they weren't threatened in any way by me. So they would, so they would guts. tend to loosen up, you know, in, in, in ways that they might not have loosened up if, if I'd been a, a, a really big person, you know. <laughs> Are there uh, sort of specific people that you can think of that perhaps? N no specifics, no. No. Specifics. no. <laughs> um, well, speaking of which, um, I was thinking about some of your fiction, and uh, one of the times we did speak, you said that people didn't think of you as a fiction writer, um, or they don't as much. And I think your female characters are so strong. They're anything but frail, and, and they're so memorable. Um, and do you think, why do you think that's true? Why do I think they, because, the fiction that I have written has not sold as much as the nonfiction I have written. I, that, 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 that comes to mind as, <laughs> as the reason people think of me most often as a nonfiction writer. <laughs> that is a solid reason. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know, I just think of a certain you're also so good at naming these characters. Inez, Victor, Charlotte Douglas. I love that name, yeah. It's I a great name. I, I love Inez, yeah. And do you, do you think about the, them ever? Do I think about those people? Yeah. Once in a while I think about them. When I, I mean, I definitely I think about Inez and I think about Charlotte Douglas. Um, Charlotte Douglas is the book of Common Prayer. She was in a book of common prayer, and she, and her, and her, she was married to a, to, a, to, a, to a political, to a lawyer in San Francisco. And when asked by someone what, what her husband did, she said, he runs guns. I wish they had caviar. I mean, that, the minute I heard that, actually I heard somebody say it. Oh, that's a piece of dialogue from it's, 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 life. It's a stolen piece of dialogue, yeah. Okay. And the minute I heard it, I knew I had that book, you know. From the one line. From that one line, yeah. 
Is that, it's funny, because I feel like uh, that would probably, that's actually very surprising to me that something such as a full-length novel could conceivably come from a little nugget like that. It would seem that that was more what essays, where essays came from. Um, no, no, you, 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 can, you, can throw a whole, you can throw a novel into focus with one overheard line. And if you don't hear that, but if you, don't he, if you, if you never hear the right overheard line, then, you, then, then you're lost forever in that novel. That sounds awful. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know you mentioned that about uh, seeing a, a, I guess it was a model walk across, was it the Beverly Hills Hotel or in Vegas? No, it was in Vegas. In Vegas, uh, for Play It As It Lays. Yeah, that was, that, 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 that moment gave me, gave, really gave me Play It As It Lays. Um, well, I was also going to ask you a little bit about some of your sort of early jobs. Um, you start writing a column for Life magazine in 1969, and you write about it a little bit in The Year of Magical Thinking, and you said that you had a frustrating phone call, you were in Hawaii, and John warned you that it would be like, quote, being nibbled to death by ducks. Going to work for life, right. He was very opposed to my going to work for life, and I was really so determined to, because, because the, the person who was then in sort of running things at life, he was, what I didn't realize was that he was on his way out, but he was at that time running things, and he took me out to lunch, and he said, and he talked about what life could do for me, and he said, We'll put you in a world in revolution. Well, <laughs> naturally, I wanted to get out there into that world in revolution, you know. And then they wanted you to write about home? They wanted me to write about, introduce myself. You know, they, they wanted, essentially, they wanted a different kind of piece than I was going to write. Well, the, the nibble to death by ducks thing, I mean, is probably the most accurate description of freelance magazine writing I can any, think yeah, of. Any, <laughs> any freelance, yeah. I mean, do you feel like that was another, why do you think, it was it just the, the sort of managerial change, or do you think they had a conception of you as a certain kind of writer at that point? Well, uh, definitely it, it, was, it was the managerial change because the person I was talking to told me he could put me in a world in revolution did not have a, an idea of me as somebody who was going to write the kind of piece they, had in, they later had in mind. How long? When did you stop? Oh, I only worked for life. I had a year's contract and I, and I let them off it at the end of six months because they simply weren't running me. I mean, I would file every week and the pieces wouldn't run. So I could have actually just made them, made them pay me for the year, right? But that seemed too dispiriting to even contemplate. <laughs> have they ever said that you were just gonna write into a black hole, basically? I was writing into a black hole, yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's funny, because I think a lot of young writers have this experience of trying to pitch someone something, and I remember in, in one of your books, uh, you uh, talked about sitting across a, a dinner from an actress and having difficulty imagining what it would be like for her to be at other people's whims, to sort of almost wait to be called upon. Right. Um, do you remember when there was a shift for you with that? Because at some point, there must have been that. No, I mean, what I, what, 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 what I thought about the actress was, was that, that if you're a writer, you can always write something. Whether or not anybody publishes it, you can write it. It's, it's, it's not so true if you're an actor, you know. If, into the mirror. <laughs> in, it, doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Um, you know, it's funny when you, in terms of being a writer. Um, in the White Album, you had written, our children remind us of how random our lives have been, because you were speaking in your daughter's school, um, I think in Brentwood, and this is in the late 70s. Um, 
I feel like people assume that because you've, you know, I assume this with many writers, that because they've achieved a certain status that everything they did up until that point was on purpose. No, 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 nothing was on purpose. Everything, <laughs> everything just kind of happens, you know. And do you still feel, after the 15 books, that it's a little bit, does it feel a little up in, the, up in the air. Still? Still. <laughs> I have no idea. I, I, I did not, in fact, think I could finish this last book. And when I say that, people usually assume, because it's, it's a very sensitive subject, that, that I couldn't finish it because it was too painful. Not at all. I didn't think I could finish it because I didn't think I was getting it right. You know, I, mean, I didn't think I was, I didn't think I could finish it, period. So I mentioned to my agent, who is Lynn Nesbitt, that I didn't think I could finish this book and I would give the money back to Knopf. And they and Lynn said, "Why not wait a while?" Is it because of the money? Well, I mean, <laughs> because she's an agent. I mean. <laughs> she's vested in your emotional health as well. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. I was actually gonna. I'm skipping. That's skipping ahead a little bit. But while I have the opportunity, I was gonna ask you. I understand fully why, if you feel like you're not doing an adequate job considering the material, why that would be difficult. What was it like when the writing started going well? Because everyone has that moment where you think, oh yes, it's going so well. Was it mixed because of the topic? Uh, no, it was, well, it was, yes, it was mixed, mixed, just it, just, it wasn't mixed. The thing is still, is, is the thing you're, you're doing, the work you're doing is at some level separate from your life. Uh, it's different. So you don't feel, so you, you, can, you can hold those two ideas in, A, this is, this is an impossible subject for me to write about. B, I am writing about it and it's going pretty well. You, you can hold those ideas without, without breaking up. Does it actually help to do it? What? I mean. The, the word catharsis obviously gets thrown around quite a bit pertaining to these two books. I don't see, see uh, ca there's no catharsis for what they're about, actually, so, right. so, it, doesn't, so it doesn't quite work that way. Um, I was also gonna ask you then, just to, to back it up a little bit, uh, these are the cards, they're very, they're very thorough. Um, if you could talk actually a little bit about the writing process then, sort of speaking of which, of both of these books? Um, the, like talk, every day, kind of. Well, I, I mean, every day, I, I wish I worked every day, but in point of fact, I did not work every day on this book. Um, normally, if a day, if, because, because, because my life was too, too confused by things undone, you know, so I, and bad scheduling. So I, so I wasn't working every day, and, but when I am working every day, you get a kind of rhythm going. You, if, you, if, you, if you don't work every day, you don't get any rhythm, and you can't. Do you have rituals that you do before you start to write? Before I start to write, I, I, the night before, I mean, uh, when I finish work in the, at, at the end of the day, I go over the page, pages, I, the page that I've done that day, and I mark it up, and I mark it up and leave it until the morning, and then, uh, then I make the corrections in the morning, which, which gives me a way to start the day. Are you harder on yourself at night? No, but I can have a drink at night. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, 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 the drink, um, loosens me up enough to, the, to, to, to actually mark it up, you know, where you, you'll just be kind of be tense and, and not sure. Marking up something is, 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 is just another way of saying editing it. Right. But, but you don't edit very dramatically. You, 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 you don't, you're not very hard on yourself. You're not very loose with yourself. 
most of the day. It, 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 it really, I have found the, the, the drink actually helps. <laughs> <laughs> Just to loosen you up. Right. I should, I should do that. <laughs> um, I was going to, you know, I don't expect you to remember every single interview you've ever done, although that might be fun. We could just go through them all. Um, but when you were 35, you happened to have filled out a questionnaire for Harper's Bazaar, and they asked you, uh, and I could feel, like, I was just thinking about the editing and almost becoming increasingly, almost like you're having a conversation with the work, you know, a little more annoyed by if you, if you find that you're using the same word again and again, you start crossing it out maybe a little more violently. Um, and you started out answering uh, very straight. Uh, it was, you know, how old are you? You know, what, what are your books? What do you like to do? And then um, they, the questions were just endless. And they said, what comes to mind when you hear the words women's liberation? And you said, parades. Parades? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what was in my mind. <laughs> Not clue one. I think you just wanted to not be answering the questionnaire. I think. Was I trying to get a job? You were, it was, no. <laughs> no, but the questions were very much, I mean, it was of the time and it was very, but it was very much, you know, do you do the cooking? Does your husband do the cooking? Oh, yeah. What, you know, where you think a woman's responsibility is. And what's interesting actually about that questionnaire is that you talked about being more comfortable around men. I Clearly, I would say anything. <laughs> you were just trying to... I just love parades being the answer. <laughs> um, do you read, you know, it's funny, I feel like with uh, women's fiction, which I don't, you know, it's funny, on the one hand, I don't consider yours, or, or women's writing in general, I don't consider you writing that in that genre at all, but I feel like in a way that's a default what you are writing, and I'm wondering, I feel like every five minutes there's a trend piece on Slate or the New York Times about, you know, women are getting pigeonholed this way and we're not taken, you know, serious, seriously as journalists, and do you follow any of that, or? No. You don't read any of it? No, I don't, I, I really. What do you read? Well, I've been trying to follow the, 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 the campaign to the extent that it exists, you know. <laughs> I've been trying to catch up with the campaign because I seem to have gotten seriously behind. <laughs> you should, um, we had, John and I had discussed that you uh, recently are the, a new owner of an iPad, which would come in handy to watch some of the video clips oh. of Rick Perry or Herman Cain. Well, you see, I don't, I, I would have to learn how to use the iPad first. <laughs> <laughs> It'll look the same, <laughs> on or off. <laughs> Um, well, I want to talk a little bit about these, these actual books, um, and first the sort of the very structure of them. Um, they get described very effortlessly as memoir. Do you think Yeah, I don't memoir? like the word memoir. I mean, I really don't <laughs> like it. I, and I, I, I kept telling Shelley, my editor, um, that I didn't want this to be a memoir. It's not a memoir. You know, couldn't we not put memoir any place on it? Well, I think you probably end up putting memoir on it because the, the library, it has to have a Library of Congress category, you know, someplace on the, on the title, on the opposite the title page. So I don't know what I thought it was. It was like, it was an extended essay, but memoir seemed a little soft to me. Does it, it just seems not? Soft. There's no facts in it. Well, I mean, that's the word. There are no facts in the word, right. you know. Um, well, actually, speaking of that, actually, the one of the characteristic things about this book and all of your writing um, that John Banville actually recently noted in the New York Times book review of this book um, are the, the sort of signature details. And he wrote, um, the book is sort of filled with Christian Louboutin shoes, Cakes from Payard, Sweets at the Ritz, and the Plaza Athenae in Paris, the Dorchester in London, even the far past is stuck with labels like an old-fashioned traveling trunk. And obviously these details evoke a time and a place, um, but I wonder 
why you use them, and if those similarly to the humor timing just come out naturally or if they're, they're added in? Um, well, I mean, I, I, I just kind of grew up with the idea that details were what made, what gave you the scene. That if you didn't have the details, you didn't have anything, it just kind of floated there. It was a memoir, you yeah. know, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I did. Just this shapeless. Amoeba shapeless, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so details were, were they, 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 just, they just have always come to me because, because I work, because I spend so much time working to get them. There's that, um, you wrote a piece that I love on uh, Hemingway uh, in, well, for the New Yorker. Sorry. Well, you see, I taught myself to type by typing out Hemingway when I was, you know, a baby still. I mean, I was in, I wasn't, I was barely in high school. I was like in the seventh or eighth grade. I wasn't in high school. And by typing Hemingway, I got his rhythms in my head, you know, which were, turned out to be kind of catching. You can feel it. Yeah. yeah. Well, and he had said that, um, you know, after a while, words lose their, I'm going to butcher this, but uh, words lose their meaning. And well, he was talking about those big words. Yeah, yeah, he could only stand to hear the names of places, the yeah. proper names of places. Right, the, 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 which is like, the, like going for the details. Right. Because sometimes they, for me at least as a reader, I think have a real sort of, I feel an inclusion with them. Mm -hmm. um, when you mention a name and I think the sort of, it's like good cholesterol, bad cholesterol, I think the good version of, oh, I'm supposed to know who that is. And I feel like I'm there. And then sometimes I feel like they're keeping me at a bit of a distance. Mm -hmm. But do you think about that as you write or it's not? N n no. Uh, I mean, I, I never, naturally I, sanity wouldn't let me Maintaining sanity wouldn't let, wouldn't let me think I was keeping the reader at a distance. Right. <laughs> well, certainly not with these, these two books. Um, we are going to save this one for later. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you also about, I guess I'll skip to the, I'm going to skip some stuff here. Excuse me. These are very long questions. It's actually kind of fascinating how long they are. <laughs> um, I did want to mention for, that I saw the play of the Year of Magical Thinking when it came out. Um, and you had talked about, you've spoken about what an important time that was for you psychologically and physiologically, really, because they were, they were, you know, they had Cafe Didion set up and, and were making sure that you ate. Um, but I have to say, there's a, there's a part where Vanessa Redgrave screams into the audience did I lie to you in mm -hmm. reference to keeping Quintana safe? And I was just sort of blown back in my chair. And do you remember the first time you heard that? I wrote it. I know, but when you... <laughs> True. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but when she spoke it. Uh, yes, I do. Because it was... It, it, because we'd been struggling with that particular part of, of, of the play. And suddenly it seemed to wake up there when I heard her, the first time I heard her say that. It seemed as if we had hit, hit something that, that, that was a wake up. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny, I was thinking about some of the older pieces you wrote, uh, the profile of Patty Hearst, uh, the Central Park jogger, and you know, in, in reading for for tonight, really, I was just sort of struck that a lot of your pieces start out with an ordinary evening. Someone's making dinner in their apartment, someone goes for a jog, and then they get sideswiped by tragedy. Patty Hearst was making a tuna fish sandwich, right? Patty Hearst was making a tuna fish sandwich, and mm. you were making a salad and mm. fixing bourbon. Um, and you know, there's that oft-repeated line, you sit down to dinner and life as you know it. 
changes. Do you see foreshadowing in your other? Do you ever read the reread? No, the I don't. I mean, so I, it's just me. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't actually. See, I, well, I'm a really slow study, and so I, I don't actually see a whole lot. You know. <laughs> oh, I don't. It comes out. It comes out the reverse of that. Um, you also have written that there are two kinds of grief, uh, the preferred kind associated with growth and development and what's called pathological bereavement, which is really what you were going through. I guess uh, in retrospect, I was going through pathological bereavement as opposed to the good kind. <laughs> yeah. But it's funny because I think for from... <laughs> but everybody goes through... That. Everyone must go. That's the thing, is it? Yeah, I, I mean, feel like socially you must... Yeah, I, met, I have met a lot of people who appear to have gone through pathological bereavement, if that's what it is. Well, it's a proportional response. Mm -hmm. I think that while it might be preferred for you, as the person who's going through it, I think people do expect you to be devastated. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems almost like it would be not the preferred kind at all, from a social standpoint. Well, it seems to be the preferred kind, <laughs> is all. Um, you know, you had told New York Magazine recently that magical thinking wrote itself, and this did not. Why was this more difficult? Um, Well, I mean, for a, for a, for a lot, for a lot of reasons, but it, it just seemed really hard. It was a it was a different it was a, it was in a different rhythm than I'd ever used before. It was a different way of writing, and and I had to kind of find that rhythm and make it up as I went along, which hadn't been true for a while. It wasn't, certainly wasn't true of magical thinking because magical thinking did kind of write itself. But this was a different rhythm, totally, totally different rhythm than magical thinking. It, it, it may look like the same, the same, but it's not. I mean, I can tell that. I think you can tell it slightly. Um, it's a little more like jazz. It's a little more like jazz, yes. Than mm -hmm. I think that your magical yeah. thinking was. Um, you know, did you feel a sort of moral responsibility to finish it in addition to Lynn telling you that you should really take a crack at finishing it? Uh, yeah, I felt a moral responsibility. You always feel a responsibility to finish something you start. Not that I have finished everything I started. I mean, I've done. I have started a lot of things I didn't finish. Um, but I did feel an obligation to finish this. When I was taking notes on the book, I jotted down. Remember, Quintana went to Barnard because I was worried that I somehow might make a disparaging comment about Barnard, which I am what, 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 not what, in the what, habit what? of making. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not, I don't, it's, it, it hasn't, the word has crossed my lips more in the past two seconds than it has uh, in years. But I caught myself writing this down and I wondered, why am I being so incredibly careful? Uh, yes. Do you think people are too careful with you now? Are too careful with me? I, I, I never think people are too, too careful with me. <laughs> Naturally. They're not careful enough. <laughs> not, not half, no. Well, actually, speaking of which, we had talked uh, briefly before the other time when you said, oh, we took a trip together, and I said uh, we didn't. But <laughs> I did pick you up, and we went. Um, it was for the paperback of the Year of Magical Thinking, and a woman stopped you while we were walking across uh, BEA and told you this really heartfelt and terrible story about her nephew who had just died of leukemia and asked you what, you sh what she should do. She suddenly was asking you. Um, and you were so polite to her, but it's, it's like she wanted more and more from you, and I'm wondering how you deal with that. Um. For a while, uh, I had, when I first started writing, when I was when I was writing for 
actually for Vogue, I wrote some personal pieces. And the reason I wrote some personal pieces, it was kind of by accident. It was one of those things where we had assigned, I was on staff, we had assigned pieces and put the title of the, these pieces on the cover. And then the pieces didn't come in. The people didn't, the writers didn't deliver the pieces. So suddenly I was left to write the pieces. So, so the pieces all had titles like jealousy, is it a curable illness or <laughs> um, self-respect, it source its power. <laughs> and it, it was, but they had, a lot of people read these pieces and they be, uh, and people, you were tired. Uh, for the first time, people would come to me for life advice, and I hated it. I mean, I, 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 had, I, had, I, I had I quit writing those pieces because I couldn't take this Miss Lonely Hearts role, and and I hadn't written anything that got that kind of response until Magical Thinking. In between all these years. And magical thinking, suddenly people were speaking to me in airports. And usually they had some really terrible thing that had happened. And I learned simply to, that I didn't have to take it so personally. You know, I, I learned that I, that I, that I, that I could talk, that I could talk to them without without taking it personally, and I, so I, I, I didn't have to stop writing. <laughs> well, they, you know, it's, it's, it's funny when they, they expect, that when they start asking you for advice with, the, with, I mean, I say the first book, I mean, do you consider these books sort of companion, like in conversation with each other, companion? No, I think, I think they're totally different. You don't? Because they, you mean this book, Blue Nights and Magical Thinking? No, I think the style is so different. Style is, in some, to some extent, everything for me. I mean, and the style, these are such a different style. That they work differently. I mean, I say that as a writer. Not as a Not as a real wife. person, no. <laughs> um, but were you prepared... Stylistically, you're right. They couldn't. I mean, they're obviously quite different. But were you prepared for people to stop you this time? Because you just came off several. You went to several events. No, I wasn't because I didn't realize that the, that that the book was actually. I didn't. I was doing promotion. I was. I'd been doing promotion forever. It seemed to me, but I didn't realize that anybody was actually reading it. You know, <laughs> that we hadn't reached that point. <laughs> I'm not even sure it was for sale. Um, and then I guess lastly, before I open it up to the audience for questions, I was going to ask you about, I guess now that we've covered some early life and, and, and current, um, what now sort of brings you joy and what now are you sort of up to post these two books? Well, the things that bring me joy are the same things that have always brought me joy, or which are small things, you know. Well, sometimes they're really big things, like the sun going down over the Pacific brought me joy last week. Um, I wonder also, you, you had said at one point, if you weren't a writer, you would have been an actress, but I feel like your real alternate calling might be chef. Chef, no. Have you seen the... <laughs> well, let's see. I wish I had that. Oh, here we go. Okay. This is just the meals that are included in the recent book. Gumbos, soufflés, creme caramel, linguine, linguine bolognese, peach cake, and a respectable amount of bourbon. Oh, I am so hungry. <laughs> <laughs> no. You made half these things. <laughs> Except for the peach cake. <laughs> Um, but, I, but I haven't cooked in, in, in a while. I mean, I, I haven't cooked. I tend to, 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 to a disgusting degree, I, I, I tend to call out for things. You know, I mean, I, I'm even planning a, 
a holiday dinner that involves takeout Chinese. <laughs> really? <laughs> so you really have become a New Yorker after all these yeah. years. <laughs> um, well, thank you for thank you. Thank speaking you. with me. Um, and I just wanted to open up this, uh, since I figured a lot of people that probably have questions about Blue Nights and anything else. Maybe not anything else. And uh, if anyone wants to form a line towards the center to ask Joan a question, we can take some of them. Hi. 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 Hello. I can't see you, but. You can't see me. Yeah, no, I can't see you That's okay. Yeah. I can see you. Um, I thought of a word when I was reading Blue Nights. It's a Russian word called Tosca, I guess, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And there is no translation in the English language, but Nabokov has given a sort of definition. And one way he one one way he describes it is a dull ache of the soul. And I was wondering, I guess I thought blue nights was kind of like the color of Tusca. And I don't know. Um, what do you think of that word? That's my question. I don't know. It sounds like acid. -y. Um. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, it's, it's, it sounds like what we mean by acidy. Uh, and I don't, I don't know that Blue Nights is like acidy. But I don't, but I don't know. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks. Hi. Hi. You spoke before of how important it's always been to you to get the details and to put them in your work. Was that always sort of instinctive, the way you've always worked, or was it something you had to teach yourself, the importance of the details? Uh, you always have to teach yourself everything. But I mean, but that was, since that was one of the first things I was ever told about writing, it kind of started, I started learning it fairly early. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, I was wondering what you were reading when you were a teenager and, um, and what books meant something to you when you were a teenager. Oh, uh, well, obviously, Hemingway meant a great deal to me when I was a teenager. And so did Henry James. And Oddly enough, because it's a totally different style or, or absence of style, oddly enough, uh, my favorite book from that period was um, totally frozen. I, I can't. <laughs> what? Ford Maddox Ford? No, no, I loved Phil Ford, Maddox Ford, but the, but the one I'm thinking of is the one with Elizabeth Taylor in the movie. You know. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> no, 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 no. The, what is Someone it? Someone just say Raging Bull. No, 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 not, ra not Raging right. Bull. I, the, the one where, 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 where someone drowns in the lake. Oh, yeah. An American tragedy, yeah. <laughs> what? Place in the Sun was the movie, yeah. What did you like about that one? Well, it was tremendously powerful. I mean, it was, you, you, you didn't put it down until you finished that book. Um, I, have a, uh, I have a question that's about procrastination, actually. In, yeah. Uh, in um, one of your essays in political fictions, you used um, your own procrastination about writing a piece. I think, I forget who, Life maybe had assigned you a piece about the campaign, and um, you procrastinated on it. And then, right. And then in the essay, you ended up using your procrastination as... Um, as, as a lens, or not even quite sure how to say it, but as the lens that um, illustrated kind of the, the fakeness um, of politics. And 
I'm just wondering how you came to that insight that you could use your procrastination um, in your, you know, in the writing, in the essay. I have no idea how I came to it because I, I can't, um, I can't think how I could have come to. Uh, generally, you try to rationalize your own failings, you know? and I guess that was one more example. <laughs> um, okay, then this. During this conversation, you just mentioned that you saw yourself as a, um, you said that something about how you're slow and actually you don't notice much. And I'm just wondering if you could like explain that or elaborate on that. Since I think I meant I was a slow study. I don't, <laughs> I, 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 I don't. Maybe I misheard. I don't always, I mean, I'm not very slow, but I'm a slow, I am a slow study. It takes me a long time to learn something and I have to be told it over and over and over again. But does and that help with writing a little bit? Does it help with writing? Well, well because then as you, you're sort of examining the process as well as the thing you're learning. It, it, doesn't, hurt. it doesn't hurt, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of useful. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, so my mother died about two years ago and I remember that uh, moment as one of sort of utter confusion in my life. Yeah. Um, and when I read your books, uh, especially the last two books, there's so there there's sort of an elegance there that is at a complete uh, I mean it just it doesn't make sense to me how, how that emotion um, becomes so ordered. And so I was wondering how, how you go about sort of dealing with these experiences in a way to put them into a book and why do you do it? If it's not catharsis, why are you writing uh, a book about it? Well, it, because it's something that happened. Mm -hmm. it, so, so I want to. So I want to. So I. So I. I want to understand it. In order, in order to understand it, I have to write about it. I mean, I, I can't understand anything without writing about it. it. A lot of writers are have that failing. When you put a, when you put them down, when you finish the manuscript, do you feel like you have that understanding you were looking for? No. <laughs> <laughs> but you're but you're closer to it. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Um, <clears throat> wow. um, I was wondering if uh, this is premature, obviously, but if you saw yourself uh, writing anything else in the future. <laughs> well, gee, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Also, uh, I wrote you a letter in 2008, so thanks for uh, getting back to me. Did I? Did I? Did I, I, I never answer me all. Oh, well, you got back to me, so thanks. Well, th <laughs> you shouldn't admit that because you, she got back to me. Earlier, you talked about needing a drink at the end of the day before you could start editing, and I was just curious what your favorite uh, sort of pre editing drink was. Well, <laughs> that, that, I, at, the, at the time that I was d d thinking, that I needed a drink before editing. At, at that time, it was bourbon. Uh, it's not. N now I've s slipped into the white wine mode. <laughs> <laughs> and Chinese food. Yeah. <laughs> Couple more. Um, Can I do two more? Yeah. Okay. You write really beautifully in the year of magical thinking about the first time that you'd written something and not had your husband there to read it and talk to you about it. I was wondering what the past few years have been like as you've like continued writing and, and adapted to this. Uh, well, it, it was the first time that was difficult. After the first time, after the first time, that, that was just the way it was. So, I mean, I, I, the first time was a shock, but after that it was, well, not easy, <laughs> but okay. Thank you. Thank you. One more question? Um, there's a line in, I think, one of the really old essays um, that mentions you finding it hard to be at New York Public Library, and I just wondered how you felt about it now. I found it hard to be at the, I used to be, spend my, I spent my early part of my life at the, in New York, at the New York Public Library. I used to come here for the day, for the day on the weekends, you know, and just sit in the reading room and get books out. I, I can't imagine what I, what I had in mind when I said I found it hard to be at the New York Public Library. You 
maybe had fines. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it was familiar. Thanks uh, so much. Thank you. I think, I think that's, yeah. Um, well, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> Talking to us. Thank you.